Now, welcome, a very, very warm welcome to the second annual Global Landscapes Forum, BORN. Our theme this year is Connecting for Impact for commit, from Commitment to Action. We are all aware we sit in forums, we talk and talk and talk and we commit, but what next? During the next two days, all kinds of people will be sharing and discussing learning experiences, innovations, ideas, and most importantly, actions that we can take individually and together to change the world. Now, we have reached so far 231.5 million people. I'm letting that sink in. But it's not enough because GLF aspires to reach 1 billion people, yes, to change landscapes everywhere across the globe. Now, today on Landscape Talks, we shall spotlight the most fascinating new findings and stories from the field in just seven, seven minutes, seven minutes. Yeah, that's enough for you to absorb, enough for you to get questions, and enough for you to prepare for the Q&A that will be coming up later, all right? So feel free, seriously, feel free to keep those questions up to the end of the session and we shall have an open uh, floor where we shall be receiving questions from you and from anyone else who's watching from across the world. We shall try as much as possible to incorporate also questions from social media as well as from their website. So it's really an open forum. We're about to change landscapes. Now, to get us started, our first speaker, I'll tell you something about him. He doesn't know I know this, maybe. But he holds a very important memento, which is a beautiful cutting board. I know, I know, I know. You think that you have, so what is that? We have this in our kitchens. I know. But this is one of the first pieces of the Forest Stewardship Council certified timber in Denmark. This is, this is what we're talking about, changing landscapes and actually using wood that is you know, properly accounted for. Now, Kim Kastensen is uh, the Executive Director of Forest Stewardship Council International, and he recently arrived from a trip in Gabon in West Africa, where he was taking part in the National Forum on Forest Certification. And today, he will be sharing with us the new incentives of ecosystem services. Please, Give a round, warm applause for Kim Carstensen as he walks on stage. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So, thank you very much. I'm actually not going to talk to you about Gabon. Because yesterday I came home from a quite different place. I came home from Venice. And I want to talk to you about Venice. You may wonder why. Is Venice a landscape, or is it a waterscape, or what is actually the thing that landscape comprises? What, what we did in Venice was that we had a board meeting, we were discussing all sorts of things, and then we went out and saw some forests. You might think, are there forests in Venice? And actually, not really, because that land around Venice has been populated for thousands of years, there's been towns built, there's been agriculture, there's been drainage. It's all cultivated. But now, people see that actually that landscape is not very healthy. And what they do is they begin to think, ah, could we do some forest in this place? Could we plant some trees? And would that actually have an effect? And what's interesting about that is two things. One is when you come from a landscape with nothing, and you begin to put trees in it, then from the very beginning, your trees are thought as part of the landscape. They're not just thought as we, as a forest stewardship council, certifying forest. We think of forest as the area we manage, right? And the area we manage, we manage because of what's in it. There's trees, there's mushrooms, there's other products that are in that forest. And we don't necessarily see what the function of that forest is for the wider landscape. But in the area around Venice, where they're not used to have forests, the fascists took out the last ones in the 1930s. There, they suddenly see, ah, we need to have some trees here because we don't have them. 
and we need them. And why do they need them? And that's the next interesting point, that when you begin to think about forests as something different from just production, and that's what they do, because they think of them as, oh, we need some clean water. Oh, we need to get something that can get us rid of the noise and the pollution from the autobahn and that go from Germany all the way down to southern Italy with all sorts of products going one way and the other. Oh, we need something to deal with the carbon. Oh, we need something to have a place for our children to go out and look at what is a forest. Oh, there's a squirrel, there's a bird, there's bird song, there's all of these things. And these forests get established for not the production. They will also produce some timber once in a while, but actually they get established for what we call ecosystem services that they provide. And those ecosystem services are not, I mean, one of the forests I was in was three and a half hectares, right? That's 300 meters that way and 120 that way, right? Not a very impressive one. We, we, we joked a little bit. Are we going to get lost here? We didn't, luckily. That would be very embarrassing. But that's three and a half hectares, which, I mean, at a global scale, we have 200 million hectares certified under FSC. So that three and a half hectares are not going to make any difference from that perspective. But did they make a difference for the water in that area? Actually, that forest, which was designed to do that, sucked up a million cubic meters of water per year, put it down into sandy soils below the forest, and then spread to the whole area as clean water. Interestingly, who paid for this? This was not the owner, and then he paid the trees and stuff like that. No. The payment for this, and this is where it gets interesting, that ecosystem service of the water was paid for by local retailers, the municipality, the water board, the water service provider, and they actually paid for the trees, for the certification, for all of the management of the area for the next 20 years until it may become self-sustaining by means of the wood that it will produce. I found that fascinating because that actually gave us the reason why we have that forest in that landscape, which is tree, yes, but even more than that, the landscape values that it would create for people living in that neighborhood. And my sense is that if we begin thinking forests, not just as timber production, not just as somewhere you go and have a nice experience, but as somewhere that plays a role for the wider land. We all know it. I mean, we all know that forests, without forests, we're not going to solve the climate crisis, right? We know that. But how do you actually make that link? That's a very abstract link. But if you make the link between the forest you have there and the landscape just around it, that's a very different thing. So over the past couple of years, we have developed what we call the ecosystem services procedure. That sounds utterly boring, and of course it is, but it has potential. The ecosystem services procedure is what gives you that next step, not just we know, yes, we know that forests matter for climate. Yes, we know that forests matter for biodiversity. Yes, we know that forests matter for water. But it gives you that next level of being able to document, to verify, and to be able to know what can you say to ordinary people in the market who are interested in these things. So these forests, as I said, get paid for by supermarkets, by ordinary people who adopt a tree or something like that, the water board, everybody. And it comes from experience that is not just valid in Italy. The whole idea comes out of a project where we tested ideas in Vietnam. The pictures you see behind me are from Chile. So we tested Vietnam, Chile, Indonesia, Nepal. No rich countries, but all of these poor countries. And now, as, now I've seen it yesterday. It works in the rich countries, and it also works in a number of poor countries where people need these resources. And when you come to it, as I say, from this ecosystem services angle, you immediately are in the midst of a landscape where these ecosystem services matter for everything that's around it, whether it's like it was in Chile, a cattle farm, a cattle ranch, whether it's as it was in Indonesia, agricultural or aquaforestry landscapes around it, whether it's degraded lands around the forest, it doesn't really matter 
Because if you can have the forest and you can create those values, then you have a situation where your forest belongs in the landscape, the people see it, the people benefit from it, and you can get somebody different from the government, different from the normal donor, to actually pay for it in the end. So for us, coming into the Global Landscapes Forum, the Ecosystem Services Procedure is probably the main instrument that we will use to take thinking about landscapes into doing landscapes. I saw it in Venice on three and a half hectares. I'm going to Brazil tonight. I hope to see this in more than three and a half hectares in Brazil. At least they have the potential, they have the forest area that could make that happen. And I'm really looking forward to see how we, as an organization, as the Forest Stewardship Council, can make the ecosystem procedure be something that will benefit landscapes all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I told you, we're being reminded of the important things. When you think of forests, think of people first, and then create an ecosystem around it. Now, I will, without further, much further ado, invite our second speaker. Professor Stephen Garnett is an environmental scientist at the ja Charles Darwin University with an interest in the knowledge needed to live sustainably in the tropics. And he will be telling us why indigenous people are crucial to conservation. Welcome. Thank you. Um, where I come from, I live in, in North Australia. And the indigenous people I know and work with there don't use the word landscape. They use the word country with a capital C. And it's different from countryside. It's different the way non-indigenous people might talk about it. Because country is alive. It's full of ancestors. They talk to it. They sing to it. It is something, part of their soul is the the land to which they have traditional connections. And when they're on country, that land is healthy. When they're away from it, the land is sad, and they are sad too. And it's an ethos that most of the rest of the world has lost. So when I was asked about five years ago to run a, a session at the World Parts Congress on the contributions of indigenous people to conservation around the world. I thought, well, what we need to do is find out the, the area around the world where indigenous people still own land, still manage land, whether they still retain a, a connection to country, whether the state recognizes it or not. And I thought this would be a fairly simple task. Obviously, someone must have done this before. Uh, it turned out otherwise. It took us all of five years, and uh, earlier this year, uh, a group of about 20 of us published the first global map of indigenous lands across the world. As a, as a background, as a way of putting numbers around some of these issues that will then ensure that they have the political impact they should. And what we found was that uh, there's 87 countries still have people who identify as being indigenous uh, and that's out of 250 or so and still have a continuing connection to their traditional lands. And that's about 3.7 billion hectares of land, 37 million square kilometers, about 28% of all the land area outside Antarctica. It is a, an enormous area. Um, and then what we did was that we overlaid that with the protected area estates, uh, areas that the states in which these people now find themselves living, they don't necessarily recognize the borders, but they are within those areas. And those countries have declared areas as set aside for conservation. Now, some 40% of that area is 
indigenous land, whether the indigenous people agree to it or not. Um, there's, in Australia, it's about half of our protected area of state is actually indigenous protected area that the indigenous people themselves have, have agreed that they would set aside for conservation. Other areas, conservation has been very damaging to the indigenous people. But it is still a, a huge area of the protected area of state that is indigenous. Uh, about 20% of their land is, has been set aside for conservation. We also looked at the naturalness of, that, of the indigenous lands, and about 37% of the world's natural areas are on indigenous lands. It's, again, a, a huge area. When you consider that indigenous peoples make up about 5% of the global population, um, and in terms of the wildest areas, it's something like two-thirds of, uh, of the wildest parts of the world are on indigenous lands. It's, it says just how important indigenous peoples are to our sustainable future. Uh, we heard about forests, how important forests are. We've done another analysis, 35% of the intact forest lands are indigenous. Uh, we're doing more work now on, on biodiversity, on a whole range of things. So, and what we're trying to do with this is, as I said, give, it, give some numbers around the indigenous contributions to, uh, to sustainability into the future. Uh, because without, without indigenous peoples and without that attitude, we're not going to have a sustainable future. Indigenous peoples need to be part of all our conversations about sustainable futures. We've got these agreements uh, around the international agreements on sustainability. They make mention of indigenous people. They need to be part of all the different fora. They need to be empowered to be part of that. And these are the sorts of numbers that are needed to persuade people that they have to be there. And ultimately, we all need to take on board the idea that country needs a capital C, that we need country, country needs us. Uh, it is a, a philosophy from which we can all learn and which we have for largely forgotten. So I'm going to end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll have more questions for you during the Q&A sessions. I hope that you are writing down your questions because they will be back again to answer them. Now, our next speaker is Jefferson Hall. He is the director of Agua Salud uh, Con Project and a staff scientist at the C Smithsonian Tropical uh, Research Institute. And his goal is to use the findings of this research to improve land management across the tropics. He will be sharing with us how to apply key lessons if we want to restore tropical landscapes. Welcome, please. Thank you, thank you. So I'd like to invite you all, at least in your minds, to come with me to Panama, which is where I live. And it sounds pretty good right now because it's hot and humid there and warm. Uh, in Panama, we have, uh, we have a dry season, a wet season. Central Panama, the dry season or the wet season lasts about, about eight months. And we're at the end, of the end of the wet season right now. And so the skies are typically bright and sunny and the afternoons are punctuated with thunderstorms. But I'd like you to imagine that instead of the skies being bright and sunny, that it turns black and it starts raining buckets and buckets and buckets of rain. It is the end of the wet season, and the storm goes on for a week. Picture the, the rivers swollen with water and the city streets overflowing. Well, that very thing happened in December of 2010, at the end of what was already on track to be one of the wettest years on record in the Panama Canal watershed. Uh, the, the Panama Canal watershed experienced the flood of record. There was so much rain that uh, the Panama Canal Authority had to close the canal for transit and had to for 17 hours and had to open up all of the locks and all the floodgates and evacuate as much water as fast, as safely, and efficiently as possible. 
Now Madden Dam is a dam above on the Chagres River and it forms a reservoir that stores water for the dry season. And above that is a 100,000 hectare forested national park. Well Madden Dam was at the specifications of what it was built to withstand. So uh, I, um, we have a research project in the Panama Canal watershed where we measure stream flow and we measure stream flow under different land uses. We have forests and we have deforested landscapes and we have pastures, we've got a deforested landscape. And we have the same soils and geology as the whole uh, upper Chagres watershed, that 100,000 hectare forested national park. So if we do a thought experiment and we deforest that national park. So, one, two, three, four. That we had in our pasture to that area we estimate that we would have had 100 million additional cubic meters of water that would have hit that dam right when it was at risk of breaching. Now, if you don't know what a cubic meter is, 100 million of anything is a lot, right? Well, a cubic meter weighs a metric ton. And to put that into perspective, an elephant weighs a metric ton. So imagine 100 million elephants worth of water hitting that dam right when it was most vulnerable. So we believe that the forest saved the dam. In fact, uh, the forest uh, helped save the economy of Panama. We're told that uh, when, if the canal, if the canal infrastructure would have been breached, that it would take four years still to fill the canal with water. So if it had not been for the forest, we believe that we would not have celebrated the expansion of the canal in 2016 with the opening of the new set of locks, but we'd still be rebuilding uh, the forest, we'd be rebuilding the dam and the infrastructure and the, really the economy of Panama. So La Purissima, La Purissima was the name of our storm, and it was our superstorm. And we know that uh, one of the predictions that climate scientists have great confidence in is that we'll have more frequent severe weather events in the future, right? And the past is not a good prediction of the future. Well, La Purissima was estimated to be anywhere between a 100 and a 300 year return storm. So we all know that that does not mean that we're good for another 200 years, right? But it does mean that it's rare. It's very rare, or at least it should be. On November 24th, 2012, less than two years after La Purissima, we had another major storm. We had flooding and we had loss of life in the Panama Canal watershed. In 2016, Panama missed, just missed getting its first ever hurricane, Otto. We didn't get the hurricane force winds, but we did get the rainfall. And in both of these extreme events, we had significantly more water in our deforested area than we had in our forested area. So when we set out to try to understand the role that forests play in regulating water, we didn't know that we capture the three largest storms in the last 50 years, but we did. What we were really trying to understand is whether in a seasonal climate, a tropical forest can absorb water during the wet season and slowly release it during the dry season. If in this climate, we would have in the dry season more water in our forested watershed than we would on our deforested landscape. And that's, that's known as the, uh, the sponge effect. And so we have consistently recorded the forest sponge at our, at our research site. Uh, and over 10 years of research, anyway, over 10 years of research, we've consistently uh, measured this. And so if we think of that 100,000 hectares of forest and landscape of Chagres National Park above, above the dam, if we apply the excess water that we had in our forest during the dry season there, that would equal 20% of all of the water that the 2 million plus people who get their water out of the entire Panama Canal watershed need during the dry season. So, um, I lost my train of thought, that they need during the dry season. Uh, we're, not just, we're not just measuring stream flow in what we do though. Uh, what we're doing is we're also trying to understand and study how to restore the, the, how, the forest ability to capture water. And that's, that's the key mechanism in the forest sponge and providing dry season water. So let's, uh, let's talk about a forest and let's talk about trees. In 2008, colleagues published a paper documenting the forest transition in Panama. And so researchers believe that once a country has a certain socioeconomic status, that people will abandon the land, if you will, and they'll move to the city for better economic opportunity. And that um, once on this abandoned land, seeds will arrive and they'll germinate and a young, vibrant, secondary forest will grow. And that we call that process secondary succession. And articles that were published suggesting that the secondary forest would pick up the slack for the loss of biodiversity in mature tropical forests, they caused quite a bit of controversy and some of you may actually remember that. Well, the bad news for those of us who care about forest and climate change is that the forest transition has been reversed in Panama as it has been in many Central and South American countries where it's been documented. But there is good news, and the good news is that we've recently con conducted an analysis of, 
of deforestation in central Panama. And what we found is that uh, in the Panama Canal watershed, over the first 10 years of the millennium, that the deforestation rate was, was decreased by some 80%. And that's on the order of the best news that comes out of the Brazilian Amazon that's consistent with the uh, creation of the Amazon Fund, right? Unfortunately, just outside the Panama Canal watershed, the deforestation rate is uh, two to four times higher than it is in the watershed. So we wanted to get further into this and try to understand what does this mean for the future? And so we leveraged several data sets that we have in studies in Panama. And the first is in 2012, Greg Asner of the Carnegie Airborne Observatory led a publication on the first ever map of a country, Panama, uh, of its forest carbon using the LIDAR technology. And this is a technology of extraordinary accuracy and precision. And then we have our own study of secondary forest growth across the landscape. And we have 108 plots where we're measuring secondary forests and we're documenting the growth every year. There's 100,000 trees that are measured every year. And so we came up with a new growth model. And then we used that deforestation rate, we made a landscape change model. And we projected these recent trends out into the future over the next five or six decades. And what we found was that we're gonna lose a lot of forest. We'll lose 140,000 hectares of forest. But at the same time, we're gonna gain a lot of carbon, and that carbon is a result of growth of that young secondary forest that remained from the forest transition. So whereas we'll lose four and a half million tons of carbon in this area, an area about 20% of Panama, we're still gonna gain over three times that amount. So the protection that forests afford from floods, the provision of dry season water, the capture of atmospheric carbon, these are all ecosystem services, and we've just been hearing about those. And I'm sure that many of you recognize a whole host of goods and services that humanity gets from, from natural ecosystems. And these are generally taken for granted from the general public. Well, in an era of, of fake news, of alternative realities and systematic attacks on science, I'm here to tell you that were it not for science, we never would have understood and appreciated the ecosystem services afforded by forests in central Panama and the Panama Canal watershed. Fortunately, there are researchers all over the world who are studying ecosystem services and how to restore them. So we're entering the Christmas season and the holidays, the end of the year, and it's a time for many of us that we reflect. And I know that I have a lot to be thankful for, as I'm sure that you are, to, you do too. But one of the th things that I'm thankful for is for, for all of you and the people like you who are out there fighting the fight to make sure that we have a future that includes forests, wilderness, and one where we can confront the obstacles in front of us in combating climate change. Our own research and the research of others like us, it helps inform these great initiatives and show the importance of science in that. Working together, I'm sure that we can all build that sustainable future that we all want and that we all need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Forests are sponges. There's always a takeaway, no? Now, from Europe, we head over to Central Asia. Our next speaker, Susanne Wallenhofer, has over a decade of experience in forest and climate policy in Asia and Africa. And we have the pleasure of listening to her talk out of the forest and into the landscape of Central Asia. Please give her a very warm welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. What do you think about when you think about forests? Yes, you think about trees, maybe about wildlife. You might also think about recreational activities or even vacation, going on a hike. But there's more to forests than just trees. Have you ever thought about what forests do for you? Well, they provide oxygen, but they can do even more. And I would like to look at this with you and take you to Tajikistan and show you an example from there. In Tajikistan, more than 12,000 hectares of forest area have been rehabilitated together with local communities. In this approach, locals lease the forest area from the state agency over a period of 20 years and take care of forest plots which are about one to two hectares of size. The harvest from the plot is shared between the agency and the tenants according to a fair share principle. 
These forest resources are very um, important for the community's livelihoods. Nuts and fruits are sold on the market and timber can be used for construction or as firewood in the cold winter months. Kandemir, Mr. Kandemir, he's one of 20 forest tenants in the community in West Tajikistan. And jointly, this community rehabilitated about 20 hectares of riparian forests along the riverbank. Mr. Kandemir is very proud of his 500 trees that he has planted since he signed a lease agreement in 2013. He says, forests are one of the most important natural resources for us, and they are of great importance in people's lives, especially in rural areas like our village. Indeed, forests provide rural communities not only with firewood, but also with non-timber forest products. The springtime in Tajikistan is the, natural, is the season for natural disasters. This is when the snow melts in the glaciers and rivers carry much meltwater, which regularly causes flooding in nearby communities. The 20 hectares that the community rehabilitated in the area keeps the river at bay and also protects um, the soil from being washed away on their agricultural fields. If you look at climate projections for Tajikistan, glacier runoff will further increase the risk of flooding in many communities living along the river banks. Peak glacier runoff is expected for the middle of this century for most of glaciers in Central Asia. This means that an increase in meltwater is to be expected and is putting communities such as Kandemir's more at risk of flooding and riverbank erosion. While forests are a valuable tool for disaster risk reduction strategy, they are of course also affected by negative impacts of climate change. The floods in spring followed by month-long droughts and, and high temperatures in the summer puts a lot of stress on the forests in the area. A diverse, a, a diverse forest plot has environmental and economic benefits for the forest tenant. First, they can get a diverse harvest and this contributes to food and nutrition security. Secondly, diverse species reduce the risk of pests and also increases the soil fertility. And thirdly, high biodiversity provides habitat and nectar for pollinators, which is very important as we all know. Mr. Kandemir has diversified his forest plot with willow and poplar trees and also planted seed buckthorn along the fence. And this keeps, uh, due to its thorn, it keeps the cattle away. Um, Forest grazing through um, cattle is a major threat to forest growth in Tajikistan and Central Asia. And the fencing material is quite expensive and often too expensive for the locals to, to afford. And unlike in Europe and some other areas, not the cattle is fenced, but the forest and the agricultural fields. And the cattle just runs around freely. This, of course, hinders natural forest regeneration as it injures the root system and also increases soil erosion. Pasture rotation plans and community agreements about when to graze and where have proven an alternative to the expensive fencing for many villages in the area. Tajikistan is also a relatively conservative country. Still, women can play a very important role in forest management. They are responsible for collecting and processing fruits and nuts and other products. Usually, though, it's the men who sign contracts for joint forest management and other official arrangements. <clears throat> in recent years, due to the high labor migration among males in Tajikistan, women's have, women have been stepping up and um, also been able to take on more formally a uh, leading role. Um, so they receive um, forest management training session developed by women for women. And currently, Tajikistan has about 90 female forest users that are also registered officially and more and more are becoming interested. And the three women you see on the picture, they are some of them um, of the women who receive training in sustainable forest management. So now they know how to prune and graft the trees. They know how to plant and also what, it, what the trees do to protect their village and their families from flooding. As this example from Tajikistan shows us, forest management is about more than just managing trees. It has environmental, economic, and social aspects that should be considered. 
So <clears throat> there's a need to take a landscape perspective and replace pure technical forest management. The forest landscape restoration approach, along with the bond challenge, give a trend to look out of the forest and into the landscape. And just recently, the countries of Central Asia have come together and um, pledged several thousand hectares of forest area to be restored to the bond challenge during the Astana con conference. Forest landscape restoration brings a new but needed perspective to traditional forest management and builds a platform for exchange on successful practices at a global level. Mr. Kandamir says, we, the local people, are obliged to save the forest for our children and grandchildren. For every tree that has fallen in this country, we need to plant at least two new ones. And for those of you who are interested, there's more information about this specific example available online on the Panorama website. And uh, colleagues of mine will also have an uh, side event tomorrow afternoon where you can find out more about some of the examples that are provided on these solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker has a book on Italian historical rural landscapes, which has been um, in the 25% of the best-selling book by Springer. The Italian edition of the same book sold out three months after publication. We are hungry to change these landscapes, as you can see. Professor Mauro Agnoletti, who is the director of the Laboratory for Landscape and Cultural Heritage, University of Florence. Please welcome. Thank you. Good morning. So today I'm offering you a reflection on uh, something that has happened in the last century, and uh, that uh, century has been called the Age of Extreme by historians, because in this period we have been witnessing uh, many, many changes that had affected almost any aspect uh, of life. But during this time we had also some other changes that most of the people did not realize that were happening, and I'm speaking about what happened in the rural territory. So we've been applying a, a development model, but mostly uh, fostering uh, an industrial model of agriculture that uh, showed to be ineffective for, for many, in many rural areas to solve the economic problem of the rural population was the, it had been degrading the environment, but also destroying the social structure, also making, uh, the, generating the loss of many cultural heritage uh, related to the rural territory. So in this two, three decades, uh, there was a growing interest in uh, changing this attitude to the, uh, to this kind of development uh, with the rise of a project, uh, but basically generated by local communities, try to understand more of this, uh, of what we can call agricultural uh, heritage system, uh, where there is a lot of knowledge and wisdom concerning how to adapt to local environment, especially in very fragile ecosystem, where people will learn to survive during the century in order to solve the problems, but uh, always finding uh, an interesting and positive relation with the environment. Uh, so there are, as you see, uh, many uh, of these sites that have been uh, uh, found uh, in many, many countries in the world, uh, not only in developing countries, but also in Europe, uh, because there is, a, as I said, an interest from local population to reappropriate their history and their knowledge uh, and try to understand more of what they did in the past, or what their ancestors did uh, to find a good relationship with their environment. And coming to situation like this just to explain more in practical terms. When I say we are here in the southern atlas of Morocco, what you see is what they call an argan forest. The argan tree is a fantastic tree. Uh, it can grow in very arid region. Uh, the roots of the tree goes deep down in the soil as far as 40 meters. Uh, the tree is adapting very well to a different uh, climatic condition when it's very dry, 
all the leaves turn uh, dry. When it's, uh, you have a rain, uh, in just 10 days it can turn green. And uh, what they have also is a, a fantastic relationship with other activities like livestock grazing. Uh, you probably know, I don't know if you know the argan oil, that the, the goats, so there are shepherds there where the goats are grazing, the goats are eating out uh, the argan nuts and then and during this digestion they release a nut without the bark. The women are collecting these nuts and they're producing uh, oil both uh, for eating and also as a cosmetic. So as you see there is a relationship combining different things together, not only uh, the cultivation and production of the tree. And the other thing that I would say beside the fact that you look at a beautiful landscape is that they call this uh, a forest. So many of us, especially those studying forestry, think that the forest is a thin, thick, dense, homogeneous layer of trees covering the soil. It's not true, especially in historical terms. In the country where I come from, Italy, until 40 years ago, 50 years ago, normally what we call forest was considered a place where you have uh, grazing animals. Uh, legally, I'm saying, not just because of something you read in the books. So, you know, in all this area, you see there is unfortunately also uh, a kind of development that tends to abandon all this system because these were not just a cultivation of trees. These were a system combining together many different things. So the, the danger of this situation is that the population is moving to other areas. In Morocco is the coast. Well, you have problems that just like uh, urbanization, uh, soil consumption, uh, social degradation. And now what is interesting in this area is there's a, a flow of people returning to the land from these places along the coast. They want to go back there and try to find a new relationship with their environment. But basically what the, the situation shows is that uh, these people have been adapting to very difficult conditions in order to survive. They were not producing much but they were producing in areas where a modern farmer, at least from Europe, would say, well, this is impossible to develop a modern agriculture. And what to say about other areas like this that you see in China, uh, we are in a fish pond system uh, in the Hujou uh, area. You see here also, it's very interesting because all these ponds uh, combine different way of producing. They're producing mulberry tree, and the mulberry tree are feeding the fish in the ponds then then taking the fish in the fish, but also taking the mud uh, and using it to fertilize uh, the mulberry. So in this case, we call it system because it's not just one plantation. It combines uh, different things all together. And so you are an interesting system that it's uh, uh, working without many external energy inputs. And you know all this not because you can read it in books, but you know this from the local population because they learned in history how to do it. And uh, what to say about these uh, floating gardens? Okay, water sometimes is a problem because you need the uh, land to cultivate. So they, they're creating these islands, make a straw, where they're cultivating the vegetables beside the fantastic scenery that you see. Okay, this is very productive. They can really produce a lot. So this is helping once again to find a way of uh, surviving uh, uh, just taking advantage of what the environment is offering. So my environment is water. I need to survive in water. I'm developing my knowledge, my skills to understand how to survive there. And also this is a system because there is an interaction between the water, the fish, and uh, what is cultivated over there. And what to say once again about the oasis? Well, the oasis are places that you do not even suspect they exist if you travel in the desert. But inside an oasis, you find everything. You can find uh, uh, olive trees, uh, fruit trees, date palms, grapes, uh, and all is done with just a very tiny amount of water. And we, you don't need a lot of water. They, they just learn how to create this uh, paradise, I would say, in the middle of the desert, just learning to save what the nature has given to them. And so that they gain more cultivated area in the desert with system they are using to turn sand with nothing inside into a place like that. These are very fragile ecosystems at all levels, environmental, economic, and social. In an area like here, we are in the Siwa, oasis between Egypt and Libya. The problem is that 
too many people has found that this is a good place for living. So from all over Egypt, they try to go there. So there's too many people getting back into this area. The same thing is happening in China. In many countries, uh, we have been seeing uh, the abandonment of the rural territory. But in all these sites that are sort of having a new life, uh, there are many farmers who want to go back in the area because they found the standard of living they had in urban area unsustainable. What to say about this other aspect? We are near Naples in Italy. These are mixed cultivation. You see there is an a interesting interaction between the tree. The big, the big trees are poplar and uh, the vines. Uh, just to see, the, okay, you understand the height, almost 12 meters. So what they're doing, they're combining the wine, the collection of the leaves for the animal as fodder, they're cultivating the vegetables around the, the tree, and also cultivating wheat. So four cultivation in one place. Why all that? They need a space that they don't have. Too many people to feed, so they wanted to have a limited space. They need to have a space where to cultivate more crops. This system is 2,000 years old, and it's still there. The one is very good, by the way. But once again, where is this knowledge? where I get the information in the books explaining to me, you know, wine in Italy, viticulture, and so on. I try to find a book explaining you how this system developed by the Truscan people is working. And another big issue today are terraces. Stone terraces, grass terraces, and uh, well, all of these are offering, once again, a, a number of information on how to survive that from the point of view of the landscape, okay, beautiful, but there is a, a knowledge in the system that uh, we are truly trying to understand. So how these stones are drying, for instance, in order to uh, reduce hydrogeological risk. They play a fundamental role. Or how these systems are working to support the cultivation, that the heat of the sun is incorporated in the stone of the wall during the hot hours of the day, and it released during the chilly hours, uh, hours of the day. This is something that the farmers know, but no technician working in olive production or viticulture knows uh, considering a textbook. So what we are trying to do now is try to recover all this uh, information and try to organize courses, the big project that we have uh, in Florence, in order to create managers that can manage this area across the world. And the most difficult thing is to have uh, the knowledge as a teacher to give to the students. And just to conclude, we didn't know when we started this uh, training program, is an international master course, how many people would apply because this topic, I didn't know actually how popular it could be, especially in developing countries, uh, that are those where we send most of the information, where we receive 95 applications from 25 countries, and at the end, uh, among the, the, those students accepted, uh, this may be interesting for some of you, 80% uh, of them are women. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our last speaker of the day is Socrates Schouten, and he is the concept developer uh, and researcher on the Commons at WAG Institute for Technology and Society. He's here to talk about the Chamber of Commons, new models of cooperation. Please help me welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, this is me um, five years ago, uh, just having graduated from studying environmental sciences um, and being ready to change the world. So here you see me sitting at the office of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and since the labor market was not that strong, I chose to become a freelancer. Uh, but I was really ambitious and I wanted to pursue all kinds of different values and really improve the world. So um, I, I went to this, uh, to this lady and I said, okay, how can I uh, make myself useful as a freelancer? So, um, whoops, that went a bit quick. Well, anyway, so um, I was there and, and she said, okay, um, come on, let's uh, look at the whole list of uh, different options that you have. 
So here are the 960 categories of different sectors of industry you can be in. Uh, let's have a look, what can you choose from? So uh, growing of strawberries in open fields, fattening pig farms maybe, or manufacture of underwear, steel bending, shops selling optical articles, renting of magazines, practicing, practices of midwives, and scrolling all down the list, I saw nothing of my liking, and only at the very, very bottom there was a, you know, a very broad category of, of purpose-driven organizations in general. So I asked her, <laughs> isn't there a freelance NGO? And this happened. Computer says no. <laughs> So I didn't feel so warmly received in, in, at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and to be abundantly clear, um, there are about 956 different uh, types of, of uh, profit industry you can be in, and just four uh, that are purpose-driven. Um, so they are broadly uh, political organizations, hobby clubs, uh, uh, religious organizations, and um, well, idealist organizations. So by now I work at a idealist organization um, that thinks this is a pretty skewed situation. So we thought, can't we do it slightly different? Uh, we see so many different initiatives like cooperatives and um, uh, organizations that combine different values, not navigate on, on um, profit, but on navigate on a whole set of different values that use also mixes of different institutional arrangements and different ways of funding to get their purpose ahead. So we thought, why not launch a Chamber of Commons? Um, okay, Chamber of Commons, what should this look like? How should we go about? Well, what are commons, firstly? This is a picture from the Basta farm in, uh, in Germany, close to the border of, of Portugal. Uh, no, not Portugal, Poland, of course, um, alliterations. And at the Basta farm, they produce about uh, 50 different vegetable crops. They produce uh, six different potato varieties, um, all kinds of grains. But they do this with uh, a mixture of professional farmers, volunteers, people living and working on the farm. Uh, and they also have 400 households that they service. But those households don't just pay for the produce. They are actually uh, stakeholders, and they uh, have a monthly contribution. And they decide on this contribution uh, as a collective. Or consider um, Ojos de Aqua. This is a Peruvian in, uh, organization. Those are, again, a group of farmers that uh, were so disgruntled with the fact that you know, heavy deforestation occurred. There was a big loss of species. The water quality was deteriorating. So within uh, the, the village of Pukakaka, and I must say this is the most brilliant name for a village I think you can have in Peru, Within Bukakaka, they said, let's get organized, and they went to the state and um, kind of demanded uh, or claimed uh, 2,300 hectares for themselves uh, to manage, um, to eke out a living, but also to sustain the forest. And actually, since then, since 2003, when they got started, 99% of the illegal harvesting and uh, poaching has been uh, reduced. And both, both the Basta farm and this uh, Ojos de Agua they are um, forms of uh, really a mixture of, of a collaborative effort and they, they reach out to also people from villages and cities. Um, so to actually engage with the surrounding community uh, for them also to get involved and take up a bit of the responsibility and of the tenure in, uh, in organizing this land. So what are commons then? Commons can be defined as shared resources managed and maintained by a community on the basis of mutually agreed and enforced rules. But commons really try to look also for a different type of economy, so economy that's regenerative uh, and inclusive by design. And um, you might think that, okay, commons, you know, uh, it's maybe a bit marginal, um, but if you look again at the landscape level, it's estimated that 65% of the land is under some system of communal or indigenous ownership. And it's often not recognized uh, by the state, um, but the, the, the model is there and the practices are there. And there's really a lot we can learn and, and see if we can also um, re -again, again develop them as new models. 
So uh, the thing we want to do at the Chamber of Commons is to give more language to this kind of institution. Because if you see this heavily tilted a structure where the profit economy has a wealth of different categories, but the, the, the purpose-driven economy has really just uh, a small share of that, um, while reality actually says yes uh, to this kind of model, I think it's really important for us to start designing better institutional ways of recognizing those. And with this picture I want to show that those are not just individual citizens or farmers that are doing something. There's really network situations going on of uh, government bodies, of uh, private institutions and knowledge institutions, all the way to networks and CSOs um, that collaborate to get those new models off the ground. Um, so this is also an invitation. Uh, we can't build a chamber of commons on our own. Of course, it's just something we, we want to make vocal and bring to the public. Uh, because we really think that connecting the public, the, really the wider audience, to those initiatives will help uh, sustain those models and, and, and generate more inspiration uh, and support for these new commons. So thank you for listening and please get in touch with us if you want to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for all the wonderful presentations. I would like to invite all my speakers in order um, that they spoke. And now this is your chance to ask those burning questions you might have been holding on to. Kindly welcome to the stage. Question? Question? Comment? Contribution? Okay, we need to get the microphone to the gentleman at the front, please. And just, just one second, that they are comfortable, that they are not, you know, <laughs> okay, that they are comfortable, and then as you prepare any other questions that you have, or contributions as well. It's not always, you know, a question. Sometimes, if you would like anything to add on to what has already been said, we welcome this as well. Is everyone comfortable? Everyone comfortable. Sure. All right. Okay. Um, please, please touch with your name, um, where you come from. My name is John Farr. I, I work for C4. Um, I think um, the presentations we've had today have been absolutely wonderful. But I, I have a particular question for Stephen Garnett, who's a friend and co-author. Um, how do you think we can actually get the information that we have generated on indigenous lands now? to international forums so that we can do something about that. Uh, how do we integrate that data, that evidence, onto actions by the international community? I think it's, it's a matter of accretion. It's a, it's a matter of emphasizing the point again and again in, in a variety of forums like this as, as international meetings. The, the, fascinating over the last 20 years to see how much more recognition there is now than uh, of indigenous values in land management uh, I know there are, I've seen stands upstairs I've seen the, on the program there's a, a big emphasis on indigenous landscape management uh, that wouldn't have been there 20 years ago um, and I've also, uh, I was very interested in the way the press has reacted to this um, event on Sentinel Island in, in uh, Andaman Sea recently. I think it would have been different 20 years ago. I think that people would have gone in there. And, but now there's a respect for the indigenous peoples of that island that uh, wouldn't have been there before. So I, I think the message is getting through. I think it's... Um, strengthening the indigenous voice in a variety of forums. Uh, it's not easy for, for many indigenous peoples to, to go away from country to talk in the broader landscape. There's an issue about scaling up from indigenous values at a, at a country level to a, to a larger audience. And that's a, a gradual process in making sure indigenous, indigenous peoples uh, are given the support to, to participate in the global fora. 
So we are scientists, we can come in and produce these numbers and so on, but it's got to be the indigenous voice that, that comes from. I, I see a contribution from you. Well, I, I was just wondering whether that dimension, which I agree with, of, of having indigenous discussions at international levels and creating frameworks and understanding, I think that's enormously important. But I think what is as important is to find specific solutions where the indigenous peoples are and in the realities that they face. And their realities are not, I think, international conferences and big things. I mean, we heard about Panama earlier, right? I'm, I'm very encouraged by the government of Panama actually wanting to do something with indigenous peoples. I think we will be signing an agreement with the government of Panama to certify 140,000 hectares in Panama for indigenous communities. And I think things like that, some kind of recognition that they will get, something that I hope will be meaningful from their perspective in terms of, of using the land, getting the benefits from the land, maybe selling something. I'm not sure they'll always need to sell something, but actually being recognized for managing and owning, maybe not in an economical sense, but having the rights to that land. I think there are many, many of those options and possibilities around the world, and I think we should make sure we grab them everywhere we can. Which ties into the commons idea that Socrates just talked about. Um, do we have any other questions before we carry on, please? All right, yeah, we'll take the three of them, and then uh, before you answer, yeah? So in case the question is directed to you, just keep a note on it. But we take the three questions first because of time so that we are able to answer all of them. Please introduce yourself, where you come from, and then your question. Hello, uh, my name is Paul Laird from International Tree Foundation. Uh, really loved the, the talks, thank you very much. Um, I think there was a, really a, a lot to appreciate about really the focus on uh, communities, indigenous people. I have a, a slightly specific question about the focus on indigenous people, which is obviously extremely important. Um, in my own work, I, I spend a lot of time working with um, smallholder farmers in, in, in countries predominantly in Africa. Um, and sometimes you have that sort of contrast between you know, one set of people being the indigenous people, another set of people simply being uh, smallholder farmer communities who also clearly have tremendous uh, knowledge and, and understanding of the landscapes they work. I just wondered a little bit how you make that uh, distinction and whether it's always appropriate to make that distinction between indigenous people and other folks who have always lived uh, in, in a given landscape. Yes, please. The lady next to you. Thank you. Sandra Martinez, I'm coming from Mexico. Um, maybe just a very quick and very pragmatic idea. If we are talking about um, indigenous people, maybe the seat which is empty there should be for someone who is not academic and is just providing their experiences of how they are using landscapes. Thank you very much. Uh, and yes. Yes. Hi. My name is Felipe, and my question is also about uh, indigenous people. Because uh, we are working with agroforestry in the Amazon, and we have been in contact with some of them and to work with agroforestry as a solution, because some of them, they still yeah, some burn some of the forests in their community. But uh, it's really small area. And uh, we see agroforestry as a potential of driving uh, main crops as a cash crop to design uh, resilient uh, uh, economical viable systems so that they can have this source of income and still be able to have the, their land uh, so that there is no land grabbing in that region in the borders of the Amazon. So my question is uh, how do you see the role of designing a landscape that it can be economical viable so that it can process that land for many years and how do you, s how would you recommend uh, to give, uh, uh, a how would you suggest that we proceed on using agricultural land uh, so that we can make sure that they still uh, have this uh, the land for many years. Yeah, that's my, my question. Thank you very much. Is there anyone burning to answer? Oh, yeah. Yes, please. Answer. Well, of course, uh, there's no way to... Sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. Which, 
which answer are you, which question the, rather? The last. Felipe. Sorry. All right. But there were the, the previous... Uh, the, 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 well. Yeah, I will remind you, I noted them down. Okay. Yeah. Well, you need to incorporate uh, all these activities uh, into a uh, structure of governance of the rural territory that include this into rural development strategies. In other words, uh, even the, if you do a project, uh, a landscape project, a small area, it doesn't mean because you plant a forest that this is a landscape project. You have need a, a wider perspective. You have to explain how this puts together the economy, the society, and the environment in the long term. So sometimes the problem of this initiative is that you have money to do something, you do something on the spot, then you leave and you forget. What we're missing is that is an idea, is a vision of the future for this rural society. So that's exactly the point. Uh, uh, there's a planning strategy that we need to develop in order to make this thing successful. Yeah, in the order of sitting, yes, please. I'm going to respond to all three, if you like. Um, uh, yes, there should be um, indigenous peoples talking about indigenous issues, and there should be local communities people. And we don't make that distinction between, you can map, if we could map indigenous lands. Uh, I'd initially set off to look, uh, uh, try and get some estimates of the areas of, managed by local communities as well, and that proved to be beyond, uh, beyond me. <laughs> so we, uh, it is about indigenous peoples and local communities, and, and the definitions and the boundaries are, are fluid. And, and uh, it's about empowering local people in many cases, and this is in response to your last question, um, is that if you're designing something that's for an agricultural landscape, you've got to have the people empowered to be part of that design. Uh, it's not... Uh, what we found in, with indigenous people we work with, if we bring them into a form like this, they feel very uncomfortable. They're off their country, it's completely foreign. When we're on country with people, they feel uh, they have the authority to espouse their own aspirations uh, it, and take control of the, of the planning process. And it's very difficult working across scales of these big governments going in to talk to people about their, their local ideas. And uh, part of the process of any sort of planning is empowering the local communities to be uh, equal, at least equal parts of, of that vision. Yeah. Kim, please. Well, I, I, I thought these questions were interesting in a way because there seemed to be a common thread going through them. And that common thread, I think in my mind, is that maybe what happens when we begin talking landscape is that we move from an either-or paradigm to a both-and paradigm. So when we talk about indigenous peoples or traditional communities or local communities, of course, I would hate to lose all that has been politically fought and won by indigenous peoples in terms of rights. That would be a disaster. But we need to use that to also think about these other types of communities who live in the same way. And when we think about landscapes, maybe having agriculture in a forested landscape is maybe about not having the either it's a forest or it's a completely agricultural landscape. All of those possibilities in between with agroforestry systems, with other types of ways. And getting to the landscape means that we think about both the indigenous and the local communities and whatever rights they have and what role they can play in the landscape. And we think about different land use types in the same landscapes and don't go to the extreme of if you're that, you're not that. Right? And that's I think, is a major paradigm shift that I hope we can achieve with uh, this kind of thinking. Wow. And uh, Socrates, you also wanted to add something. Yes, please. <clears throat> I would like to uh, take your paintbrush and also paint a picture here that in addition to uh, an uh, indigenous representative that we could invite for such a panel, I think we should also invite a, a citizen representative because by far most of the final demand in, in the global economy comes from rural, uh, sorry, urban dwellers, so cities. Um, but for them, it's just a purchase that they make, for example, the food that they buy or other products. Um, and 
if we have a uh, talk about, you know, with, with institutions on the table and, and also indigenous and communities, I think also the, the, the demand community is very important. And what we try to do is, is see if we can uh, increase the understanding of, of the consumers and actually to upgrade their role from a consumer to, uh, to a uh, collaborative uh, being that actually has more knowledge of where stuff comes from and then um, get some way of maybe even getting involvement in those systems and, and have, a, have a voice in that. Wow. We've moved from this part of the problem and as explained we've come to okay then how can everyone it's not just indigenous uh, societies or communities that we need to um, be be trying to understand we should also just see how the urban setting as well is affected by decisions made either for or by the indigenous communities now because of time i would like to invite all our speakers first of all before i close any burning question any burning, I do not want you to go out saying, ah, oh, I did not ask my question. Any burning question? Okay, yes, we have one burning question. This is the, ah, uh, okay. Please make it short. Um, in your, in your name, uh, where you come from, and the question. Just these two, and this will be the last. If there is any other, our speakers will be very gracious to meet with you after this event. Please go on. Yes, uh, Kirsten, I'm from Germany. My question goes to Mr. Carterson uh, regarding ecosystem services. This is one topic. It's not like a brand new topic, and there has been enough time for critique to develop. So for me, especially considering economics, um, so I would just like, ask you what would be the path, like walking the line between valuing those ecosystem services and not having that tracked in by the by nature, economic quantification, like these issues with like putting a, like a price tag on each ecosystem service, but having the value valued. All right, and the last question, please. Yes, here. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, my name is Amelie. I'm also from Germany. And um, my question is also about the indigenous um, peoples, actually, because I really like the map about indigenous lands, but I would be very interested in a kind of heat map to see how many of these lands are actually sustainably used. Because I've made the experience that often, I work at a project in Peru, we have a small private um, conservation area, and I made the experience that often also the indigenous people are people that are of course exploiting the land. And um, it would be nice to know how these areas worldwide, how this distribution is, how the land is used by the indigenous people, if it's sustainable or not. And um, so that you could get kind of a feeling where exactly you would have to hit with your conservation goals. Thank you very much for those questions. I will kindly ask my speakers to keep it brief. We only have 4.3 minutes. <laughs> So, <laughs> so please go ahead, uh, Kim. So, I mean, I, I think there's two paths to an answer in, in this. One is sort of the overall economic thinking and, and what counts and what doesn't count, and that needs to be moved forward, and I think that's very important. But that's not where we are, what we do as an organization. What we do is to try to have practical examples and be creative. I mean, I was enormously impressed by the creativity in northern Italy around these things. I mean, the way that you could make these things have value was amazing, and who you could make it have value to. So you've got supermarket chains, you've got nature bonds that you could buy a special product, and then you, you bought two cents for your tree, and stuff like that it was really amazing. So I think that creativity in the actual situation, I think that needs to be a complement to the theoretical economical developments. Yes, please. Yeah, so if I can just add to that, um, we spend a lot of time looking at ecosystem services and trying to value them and thinking about that, and we're working with teams of economists. Um, there are some, there's some challenges, though, uh, and the first is um, people are out there selling ecosystem services, and you can, if you sell something and somebody buys it, it's successful economically, and there you go. But if I sell you snake oil, and I tell you it does something and it doesn't, and you buy it, then that's a success. So we still... We still have a ways to go to understand whether these, these, the production of these services that we're selling really, really kind of exists. Um, 
in, in central Panama. And so, so I told you a story about floods, right? And unfortunately, I had some cool video that didn't show, apparently. But um, there's, a, you know, if I talk about a 100 or 300 year return storm, right? Economists are often building to the future and valuing things on 50 years. They don't necessarily, you know, they don't include these rare events, these extreme events into the calculation like that. And like I was saying, that the predictions of the future were going to have more frequent, severe weather events. And so, um, whereas I work with economists and we're publishing papers on economics and all that, I don't think we should put everything into that. Another example, of course, is carbon. The, the bottom has fallen out of the global carbon market, right? So if we just wait on the carbon market to sa save our forests from and save us from climate change, then, then we have no hope, right? So it can't, it can't all, we need to value things as best we can, but uh, we also, as a, also as a society have to, have to take some decisions to, to move forward that might be tough decisions that way. Any other burning comments? I, got one I have my head of comments. Okay, <laughs> then this, you have exactly one minute to round up. So please make your comment with um, your last uh, takeaway for our lovely audience. And then we will go to you and then come this way, all right? Yes, please, Stephen. All right, well, you, you can't have a map of indigenous sustainability. Uh, it took us five years just to get the outline that we got. Uh, and it is such a politically loaded question. You need to go and talk to people on the ground at different locations about what they think of as, as sustainable. You can't really have a, a heat map of that sort. Um, I, it's, uh, it's got to be done at a, at a local level, case by case, as we heard about in, in Venice and we heard in, in various examples today of people doing positive things on the ground at a landscape level. Uh, it's not something you can scale up to a global map in that sense. Thank you very much, Kim. So and then we'll come like this. In the spirit of this session, I think landscape thinking is very much about moving in to holistic thinking about something is not necessarily wrong just because something else is right. You're not wrong because I'm right, and I'm not wrong because you're right but we can actually both be right and bring our different perspectives. And having these different disciplines and perspectives on reality come together, I think that's what Landscapes is all about. Wow. Hal, please. Last remarks. For me? Yes. Uh, well, I suppose that I will just follow up and say that um, uh, I hope that you really do reach a billion people in this landscape thinking because we really have to stop preaching to the choir, right? Yes. I mean, we're, we're, you know, many of us are convinced here in this room about everything that was just said. We probably all knew it. Um, but we really have to reach a broader community if we want to affect change. This is why you tweet, tweet, tweet. The, the hashtags, please, Susanna. Thank you. Um, just to pick up on the discussion, discussion on indigenous and also ecosystem um, services, I think what I was trying to show with the ex example is that the benefits are actually biggest for the people living in the area. And I think this is true not only in Central Asia, but for many of the examples. It's the people who live there who are affected. So they, they have the primary interest in actually making sure they use it sustainably and the benefit um, and, and mitigate climate change effects are prevented from natural disasters and, and increase their livelihood. So this, I think, is the, should be the main focus of any landscape approach. And there are some good tools included also in the first landscape restoration approach where you can involve uh, local communities and other stakeholders in, in the whole planning and decision making. Um, the other point I wanted to make is um, about how to reach out and how to make sure everyone is involved. And I know that GLF is great in with, with the outreach and, and uh, social media and stuff. Mm. And this is very important. And I think the digital technologies provide a very important opportunity also, not, to, not just to reach out, but also to make sure people can contribute and are involved. And we want to make sure that this is used. People can contribute and are involved. I hope you're still tuned in, please, Professor. Well, yes. Uh, Two words. First, first of all, uh, landscape uh, in an economic term is an, is an added value that cannot be replicated by a competitor. So once uh, you put the landscape in the food and you know what is behind this, if the customer understands this, it would like that buy that food instead of other things. Yeah. The last comment is about sustainability, and I want to open a discussion. But sometimes uh, we need to reflect on what we consider sustainable. 
considering traditional practices, something that they do for many of us is not sustainable. Uh, so you understand perfectly mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Two words. <laughs> Thank you, Banjigo, for moderating this panel. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. And this brings us to the end of today's panel. Please, do your hands like this. Everyone, please. Yeah. Everyone, 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 yes. Now, this is what we call Makofi Yakilo. If there's someone from Kenya watching me, you know what I mean. So this is what we do to appreciate each and every person here. We're going to, don't do it now, but keep doing this. We're going to do this three times so we do this and then this three times very fast because we are being chased out of the room but i appreciate each and every one of you thank you so much for being here one two three one two three one two three thank you very much and i hope to see you later